Hey guys, so almost 30 to 40 polls were just released today for many of the Senate and Governor elections on the ballot. I mean, just look at all of these new gubernatorial polls. A very close race in Texas. We also have a poll showing Josh Shapiro up by 20 points in Pennsylvania against Doug Mastriano. Laura Kelly, the incumbent Democratic governor in Kansas, is up by 12%. Stacey Abrams leads in Georgia. And we also have a 10-point lead for Katie Hobbs in her Arizona race against Carrie Lake. Looking at the Senate polls, we have numbers between Masto and Luxalt, new polls between Ted Budd and Sherry Beasley, as well as a poll showing John Fetterman leading by 21% against Mehmet Oz in the Keystone State. And we also have a poll showing in Ohio, Tim Ryan up by 6% in J.D. Vance. Another poll showing the Democrat leading over the Republican nominee in the Buckeye State Senate election. And of course, another poll from Georgia, Warnock plus 10, and then in Arizona, Mark Kelly is up by 15 against Blake Masters. And so in this video, I'm not going to go over every single one of these new polls, but instead focus on just two races. These two races are in very Republican states, but Democrats have a very good chance at winning both of them. We have one governor election and one Senate election. The first race we're going to look at is the governor election in Kansas. Laura Kelly is running for re-election, and she does have a good chance at winning a second term. This is a state, though, that Donald Trump in 2020 won by 15% and in 2016 by 21%. So Kansas is one of the most Republican states in the country. I mean, most people were not alive the last time that Lyndon Johnson, a Democrat, won the state in a presidential election. So Kansas has been red for decades and Laura Kelly winning by 12% to a second term would be a pretty big deal. We also have a key Senate election on the ballot this year as well, between Tim Ryan and J.D. Vance and the most recent poll between these two candidates shows Tim Ryan leading by six points. And looking at the overall spread of the most recent polls, Tim Ryan has been doing very, very well, despite Ohio being a state that Donald Trump won by eight points in the last two presidential elections. And so starting off with the Kansas race, Laura Kelly is running against Derek Schmidt, and Laura Kelly has a surprisingly high chance at winning this election. The polls really have been very back and forth, and we look at the two previous polls before this most recent one showing Kelly up 12, Derek Schmidt did lead by 3 and 4%. However, these two polls were both Republican funded, they're basically GOP internals, but if you go all the way back to September of last year, we had a poll showing Laura Kelly up 3, but this poll was Democratic funded. So this new poll is probably one of the most independent polls released in Kansas so far, and it has Kelly up by almost a solid margin. Now, of course, in the end, I think it would be impossible for Laura Kelly to win by double-digit margin, especially in a year like 2022, but this poll is having an impact on the race. Just look at the 538 forecast in Kansas. Kansas is now a lean Democratic state on the governor's map. It is more blue than states like Arizona or even Nevada. As of right now, Laura Kelly has a 68% chance at winning a second term against Derek Schmidt. If you look at how the odds have changed in the last couple of months, Laura Kelly was not always favored in this race. At the very beginning of the summer, Derek Schmidt had a 57% chance at flipping this governorship and was expected to win by a margin of 1.3%. But after this new poll was released, Laura Kelly is now favored and is expected to win by a margin of 3.3%. And so this poll really did have a major impact impact on this race, and I think that Kansas is going to be one of the major races to watch as Laura Kelly attempts to win as a Democratic incumbent in a pretty Republican state. And so I'm sure that one of the major questions some of you guys are asking is how did we even get here? In 2018, Laura Kelly was elected governor of Kansas, the 48th governor of the state, but Chris Kobach was the GOP nominee, and he was not even favored to win this race simply because he was just way too conservative. If you look at the predictions for this election, you will see that most sources had it as a toss-up. Only Savage's crystal ball had Kansas as a lean Democratic state, but in the end, Laura Kelly would win by over five points, making it actually technically a likely Democratic state. It was one of the major surprises of the 2018 cycle. Even though Democrats had other flips in states like Wisconsin and Nevada, Kansas was probably the biggest one. And so in 2014, Sam Brownback was re-elected, and he was one of the most unpopular governors in Kansas history, 
despite Kansas being a very Republican state, over 60% of voters vote for Republicans in these gubernatorial races. Sam Brownback did not even win a majority, and then his approval rating dropped to the low 20s after just a couple of years into his second term. And so in 2017, he would join the Trump administration, and Jeff Coyter, his lieutenant governor, would become the new governor of Kansas. But after eight years of Sam Brownback and his lieutenant governor, Republicans in the state of Kansas really were just upset with the administrating that they were doing. And so independents and even a huge chunk of the GOP instead shifted and favored Laura Kelly in this race, making her the 48th governor of Kansas. So this year, she will now be running for a second term, and I have her as by far the most vulnerable Democrat running for re-election in any gubernatorial race. We also have Tony Evers in Wisconsin, and then Steve Sislak in Nevada. Both of these races are also going to be very competitive, but not nearly as competitive Kansas is going to be. In the state of Kansas, Laura Kelly really is in a pretty precarious situation, and the only reason why she's going to lose this race is because of how Republican the state of Kansas as a whole is, and of course the generic ballot numbers right now don't favor Democrats nearly as much as they did four years ago. In 2018, Democrats were up by 8.6 points nationwide, now they're only ahead by 1.2. So a significant shift has happened in the last four years, basically because Democrats took power in 2020, and so the midterm year after a presidential election is going to be difficult for the party that won the presidency, and that's what we're seeing right now, as it is 2022. However, in the betting markets, we're seeing a pretty close election. I mean, typically, the betting markets favor one party over another pretty significantly if one race is favoring one candidate. If you see a market like this, the election really is going to be very, very close. Republicans only have a 58% chance at winning. Democrats have a 45% chance at winning. 58-45, statistically speaking, really is no margin at all. This race very much could go both ways, but it was not always like this. At one point, Derek Schmidt had an over 3-4 and chance at winning this election. Laura Kelly only had a 23% chance at winning re-election, but Kansas is now closer than it has ever been. Not just the 530 forecast has this as very competitive, even the betting markets right now show that Democrats are very much in this race. And another major piece of data that we have to look at is the recent Kansas abortion referendum. On the 5th of August, 59% of Kansas voters voted against amending the Constitution to remove protections of abortion rights. Now, this was the Kansas Constitution, not the national one, but only 41% of voters voted in favor of this ballot measure. If this measure had passed, it would have paved the way for state lawmakers to pass far-reaching abortion restrictions or even pursue a total ban. And so in one of the most conservative states in the country, a 60-40 margin against removing protections for abortions really was very surprising. Most analysts predicted that Kansas would indeed vote in favor of this amendment. I mean, just look at how the state has voted in previous presidential elections. The last time that a Democrat won Kansas was all the way back in 1964. Even in 2012, Mitt Romney won 60% of the vote in the state, basically the same share of voters that voted against this ballot measure. In 1964, though, this was a big year for Democrats. Lyndon Johnson won his only full term in office as he was running against Barry Goldwater, one of the most racist candidates for the GOP we've seen in the last century. And so the last time before this the Democrats would win Kansas was during the FDR era in the 1930s. So after almost a century of Republican control in the state, Kansas voting against a ballot measure 60-40 to remove protections for abortion rights really was a very big deal. And as Derek Schmidt this year is running a pro-life campaign, he is going to struggle against Laura Kelly, as the issue of abortion has become a major issue after Roe v. Wade was overturned in late June of this year. And the final thing we're going to look at in this race is Laura Kelly's approval rating. Currently, she has an approval rating of plus 20. That is her net approval, which is pretty good considering how Republican of a state this is. And so basically what 530 does here is they calculate a popularity above replacement score. Essentially what it does is it compares the net approval of a governor to how much the state favors the party they're in. So Laura Kelly with a pretty high net approval and the fact that she's in a state that favors the Republican Party significantly makes it so that her score is pretty pretty high. She has the fifth highest score in the entire country, only behind the three Republican governors of Charlie Baker, Phil Scott, and Larry Hogan, and then Democrat Andy Bashir in Kentucky. And if you go down this list, there are some pretty unpopular governors. David Ige is at the very bottom, negative 41. Kate Brown in Oregon is at negative 25. And both Dan McKee and Kevin Stitt are at negative 22. 
too. So definitely there are some governors that are pretty unpopular, but Laura Kelly is not one of them despite the fact that she is from the state of Kansas. And so if you look at the 2018 elections for Charlie Baker, Phil Scott, and Larry Hogan, they all won their re-elections pretty easily. Four years ago, Charlie Baker won a second term by 34%, in Maryland, Larry Hogan won by 12%, and in Vermont, Phil Scott won by 15%. In 2020, since Vermont elects its governors every two years, Phil Scott would go on to win by 41%. And in the 2020 presidential election, Joe Biden won all three of these states by margins over 30 percentage points. And so this really just goes to show you that popular governors can win re-elections in states that are completely supportive of the other party in every other election. But if a governor is doing a good job, they will re-elect those governors. And Laura Kelly may be an example of one of these governors. Andy Bashir, Don Bell Edwards in Kentucky and Louisiana are both examples of Democrats who won in some pretty Republican states and are still in good contention for their re-elections in the next few years. And so with all this said, I'm going to, for the very first time, move Kansas out of the lean Republican column and into the tilt Democratic column. I think that with everything we've seen so far, Laura Kelly is in a relatively strong position to win her second term, especially considering how red of a state Kansas is. But as Democrats continue to keep up the momentum that they have going into the midterms, Democrats are now up by 1.2% nationwide. I do think that Laura Kelly has a pretty good chance, even though this race can still go both ways. That's why it's only going to be tilt. What's going to matter the most is what happens in the next two months. If Laura Kelly continues to be popular, she can definitely win. And of course, with abortion rights becoming a major issue in the campaign, Derek Schmidt seems to be weaker than ever. I'm not just basing this off of this new poll, but of course... Laura Kelly's numbers are looking up, and I think that Democrats will have a pretty good night if they can hold on to the governorship in one of the most conservative states in the union. And now moving on to the Senate races, I'm only going to cover one, just like with the governor elections, and this time we're going to cover the most Republican state that I think the Democrats have a realistic chance at winning, and that is the race in Ohio. Tim Ryan leads by six points against J.D. Vance according to this most recent poll, and he has led in the polling for the last two months ever since the month of of July began, Tim Ryan has been ahead and has led in basically every single poll released since the summer began, with the exception of two. And so if Democrats couldn't somehow win in Ohio, the chances for Republicans of winning the Senate are basically going to disappear. 538 has this new page where they calculate the chances for both Democrats and Republicans at winning the Senate if we call a few races. So if we only call the race in Ohio, so no other race is going to be filled in, if we give Tim Ryan the win in Ohio, Democrats will have a 95% chance at maintaining their majority. So Republicans cannot afford to lose Ohio, and as of right now, even Republicans do have an advantage that advantage can definitely slip away in the next two months, as Tim Ryan is running a much better campaign than J.D. Vance. Now, the major issue here for Democrats is that, yes, even though Tim Ryan maintains a lead in the polling, the two most reliable polls do still show J.D. Vance ahead. Tim Ryan has led in basically every single poll released in the last three months, except for the two polls conducted by the Trafalgar Group and Emerson College, but these are the only A-rated pollsters on this list, and they both have J.D. Vance up by five. And on top of that, Democrats do tend to be overestimated in this state. In the 2020 presidential election, Joe Biden was expected to lose Ohio by 0.8%. He lost by 10 times that margin. In the Senate election in 2018 that Sherrod Brown did win, Sherrod Brown only won against Jim Renacci by 7%. Yes, this was a pretty impressive margin, but if you look at the polls, the race was expected to be a lot more solid for Democrats. In 2018, so this is the 2018 Senate election in Ohio, Sherrod Brown was leading by double-digit margins in most of the polls. And so in the end, of course, Brown did win, but the polls did still heavily overestimate him, sometimes by over 10 percentage points. So obviously, we're going to have to take the 2022 polls with a big grain of salt, but I do think that they're still statistically significant. If we look at the 538 forecast right now in Ohio, Democrats have a pretty good chance. Ohio is only a lean state for J.D. Vance. J.D. Vance only has a 69% chance at winning his first full term in office. Tim Ryan has a 31% chance at flipping the state. 31 statistically is pretty significant, and right now, J.D. Vance is only expected to win by 3.6%. Less than 
than half of the margin that Trump won by in 2020. And typically, you would expect Republicans to outperform Trump's margin in Ohio in races for governor and Senate. And so if you do look at the other aspects of this forecast, if you look at the light model based only on the polls, you see that Tim Ryan has a 59% chance at winning this race. The Economist also has Ohio as being very competitive. Right now, Ohio is the second most competitive race this year, according to The Economist forecast. It is more competitive than Nevada, North Carolina, Wisconsin, Florida, Arizona, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and Colorado. And that is pretty significant. As of right now, Ohio is one of the three toss-up races alongside Nevada and Georgia. And I mean, just a couple of months ago, it would have been pretty difficult to think of these two races to be as competitive as the one in the Buckeye State. So according to The Economist right now, J.D. Vance only has a 57% chance at winning and is expected to win by a margin less than 2%. And I mean, just look at the, how the odds have changed in the last few months. It really has been a significant shift in favor of Democrats. We've also seen a shift in the betting markets with J.D. Vance now only having a 3 and 4 chance at winning. His odds at one point were over 90. So at the very beginning of this year, Tim Ryan had a less than 10% chance at winning this race. Now he has a greater than one in four chance at doing so. And this is not a result of Republicans doing poorly in Ohio. The state is not by any means shifting to the left, but simply J.D. Vance is not running that great of a campaign. If you look at the governor race in the state, Mike DeWine is up by 15.7 points against Nan Whaley, and he was the governor that was only elected by 3.7 points in 2018, two years after Trump flipped the state in the 2016 presidential election. And so if you look at the same poll that showed Tim Ryan up by six points, Mike DeWine leads by 19%. That's a 25% difference. Mike DeWine up by 19 in the governor's race. However, if you look at the same poll for the Senate election, Tim Ryan, the Democrat, is ahead by six. When it comes to fundraising, Tim Ryan is crushing it as well. His numbers were last updated on the 30th of June, so these numbers are three months old. Tim Ryan's has already raised $21.5 million. But as of the 31st of August, so just two weeks old, J.D. Vance has only raised $3.6 million, and when you look at the details, things do not get any better. For Tim Ryan, he's raised $8.7 million from small individual contributions. This basically represents grassroots support. J.D. Vance has raised less than $100,000, and his update was much newer. These are the numbers for Vance as of the 31st of August, and these are the numbers here for Ryan as of the 30th of June. So when it comes to fundraising right now, Tim Ryan's absolutely crushing it, but that does not mean that he's going to win. Fundraising does not directly correlate to a win, but it can definitely make an impact. Just look at the 2016 Senate election in South Carolina. Tim Scott won by 24 points, but in 2020, when Lindsey Graham was running for re-election, Jamie Harrison broke the record for fundraising for a Senate election, and that race went down to just 10 points. Of course, Lindsey Graham and Tim Scott are not the same candidates, but fundraising can have a major impact, and I think that Tim Ryan, because of all the money that he's raised, is at least going to make Ohio much more competitive than it has been in the past. I mean, just look at the 2016 race. Rob Portman, the incumbent who is now retiring, won re-election against Ted Strickland by 21 points, and Ted Strickland was the former governor governor of the state of Ohio. And so with all this said, I do still have J.D. Vance winning this election against Tim Ryan. He still is a Republican in a Republican state. The R next to his name may just be enough for him to win. And of course, the governor election between Mike DeWine and Nan Whaley is going to help the Vance campaign as well as DeWine is expected now to win by a solid margin. So he is going to give Vance some extra votes. And so Ohio, as of this point in time, I have as lean for the GOP. I think that Vance can win by 3 to 4 percent, even though the race can get close depending on how well Tim Ryan does. I I'm not counting him out. I think that Ryan still does have a chance, but based on what we're seeing right now, it is still unlikely for him to win. If we have a Trafalgar poll that shows Tim Ryan ahead, I'm going to seriously reconsider my projection. But as of this point in time, I do still have Ohio as being lean for the GOP. But of course, Ohio is not a state that Democrats have to win at all. They have many other pathways to the majority. And so that'll be it for this video today. We went over the two Republican states that Democrats have the highest chance of winning, one from a governor election and one from a Senate election for the governor race. It's, of course, going to be the one in Kansas. Laura Kelly, for the very first time, I think is favored. I have Kansas as a tilt Democratic state, so very much it could still go both ways. But at this point, I think that she is in a pretty good position, considering, especially considering how Republican Kansas is. And in the Senate election in Ohio, I do still have Tim Ryan losing to J.D. Vance by a lean margin, even though this 
rating can change. As of this point in time, JD Vance is still favored simply because of how red Ohio has become in just the last decade. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure you like it down below if you enjoyed it. Comment down below. Do you think Democrats will win in Kansas? And do you think Republicans will be able to hold on to their seat in Ohio? Subscribe to my channel if you haven't, and I'll see you guys in the next video.